Today we're going to look at the top 10 decks in standard post bans and see what the win rate of each of these decks are, how expensive they are for wildcards, and what I think of those decks, whether you should try them as well. So let's get into that. And we're going to kick things off with number 10 in our top 10 meta decks. And this one is Esper Legends. Now, Esper Legends did not suffer at all from the bans recently. It didn't use any of the cards that were banned. So, um, so obviously, it's going to be doing a bit better than the other decks that were affected by that. Uh, with the deck, we start with Skrelv, Defector Might, which is legendary. And it also um, can protect all of our other creatures. You can pay one white or just pay some life. And in this deck, you can normally spare quite a bit of life. And you can make one of your creatures hexproof. So that helps protect all of your other creatures. If you happen to get Thalia out next, then your opponent won't be able to cast a lot of those um, really annoying removal spells. And even if they can, they have to kill Skrelv first because Skrelv can um, make Thalia hexproof and everything else hexproof. So uh, they're a really great combination. We have Denik, which is going to gain some life. And even if it does get killed, it then goes to the graveyard and you can pay the disturb cost to bring it back as the uh as the uh, apparition so it can come back as a 3-2 flyer that then creates lots of um investigate tokens clue tokens so it's a way to draw lots of cards so denix really good obviously coming back is really good and it stops things in the graveyard being targeted by spells so if your opponent has something like a graveyard trespasser they're trying to exile something from the graveyard they can't do that with denix on the board um, and then we've got go for the throat standard removal uh, obviously it's really important for most decks to have that kind of removal and we have gold forged theroptics opterix which is a new card from aftermath which can give all your other legendary permanent cards ward two which is massive considering we have things like obviously screlv can make things hex hexproof anyway but if you want to destroy screlv you're going to have to pay two more to destroy it or including uh, thalia's tax you try and destroy something you'll actually need to pay three more pretty much to destroy it so that's going to add up a lot this is not legendary which is actually massive for the deck because if you get more than one of these out those ward abilities are going to stack so they won't have ward two they'll have ward four or more so obviously huge for protection for this deck then we have adeline another um legendary creature that can make lots of other creatures really good at blocking as well and can do lots of damage and Rafine is the main one in this deck, which is going to make a huge difference. This is the one that brings it all together. Whenever you attack, you can connive X times where X is a number of attacking creatures. So because we can attack with things like Thalia, which is going to have first strike, or Denik, which has a higher toughness and will get lifelink, we can boost any of the creatures we're attacking with and gain some life or put a big threat out there. People might not want to block your first big first strike attacker. So um, obviously, Gold Forged Thopterix is, um, is flying as well and lifelink. So putting uh, extra plus one counters on these things with Rafine is really useful. And obviously also conniving means that if we draw like three Thalias at the beginning or three Rafines, we can filter away the ones that we don't need and draw some extra cards. So um, conniving is going to really help fix your hand with um, not having duplicate legendaries, although sometimes you might want to have at least one backup just in case it does happen to die. And Rafine, although it does die to cut down, if you have Skrelv, you can protect it. Also, it has Ward 1 anyway, so it costs more to uh, to attack it. So quite difficult to remove, considering it's just a 1-4 to start with. But once it attacks, if it connives on itself, then it will be out of range of cut down anyway. So it's quite a difficult one to deal with. In this version of a deck, we also have Gix, because there's a good chance that when you um, hit the opponent, they are, when you attack the opponent, they probably won't block if you're attacking with a Thalia or if you have a Ravine, a Rafine, or a Cold Forge Thopterix, which is attacking. They might not be able to block the flying creatures. So you can do combat damage to your opponent and you can draw extra cards by paying life and you'll have extra life with, uh, with life gain that we've got in different places here. Also, Skrelv can make something unblockable. So if you really want to hit with one big thing, like maybe an Adeline, uh, you can hit with Adeline. You can draw cards, you can do lots of damage. So that works out pretty well. 
It's a legendary deck, and we have Shieldred, obviously, because we have black in the deck. Why would you not have Shieldred? Uh, drawing cards with Rafine, with the Knife Trigger, obviously you're going to gain lots more life, so it makes it really difficult to try to race this deck. If you get to this point with um, Shieldred out, you're going to gain lots of life, and obviously it's a great blocker as well. And then we have Urtai Resurrected, which is kind of a removal for the deck. It's Flash, so it can come in at any point. It can counter a spell or an activated ability and it can also destroy a creature or planeswalker so that's pretty big for four mana that's going to give you a three two it does give the opponent the chance of drawing a card which isn't ideal but considering whatever you're going to be destroying or countering it's going to be much worse than just one card most likely so obviously it's still a good one to get in there and then we have oh the dawn sky which is again a big creature it's flying so it's hard to hit it's hard to block and if it does die you get to either look at cards and bring some more things out onto the battlefield or you can put two plus one counters on each creature you control and there's potentially a lot of creatures out um, so it's going to boost everything massively so it's a really um really powerful deck it's number 10 in our top 10 it's quite expensive wild card wise we have ao uh Ty, shield red gix rafine adeline Thalia. Is it actually everything? I think it is. Oh, no, apart from Go for the Throat. And, oh, Throptics is only an uncommon. But apart from that, everything else is a rare or a mythic. So it's a really, really expensive deck. And also, when you look at the mana base, because we have multiple colors, we want to have lots of rare lands that are going to have at least two colors. We've got Plaza of Heroes, which is also a rare. And we can have multiple copies of the Kamigawa Channel lands because they are discounted by having um the legendary creatures out so the more legendary creatures we have out the cheaper they are so a ganjo can be one mana four damage to an attacking or blocking creature or a one mana re return something to the opponent's hand or we can also use takanuma as a one mana mill things and remove return a creature or planeswalker to your hand as well so it's a really expensive mana base really expensive deck if you don't have the world cards, it's probably better not to craft this. If you happen to have the cards, then sure, have a go. But if you if you need to craft all of these cards, just to try it out. It's going to be too expensive. So keep that in mind. If you do want to try the deck, you might have a lot of the cards anyway from collecting them. But if not, you might want to pass on this one. Then in at number nine in our top 10, we have five color domain ramp which is a really fun deck to play. I've used this one recently. You basically just want to go from Topiary Stomper to Invasion of Zendikar to be able to get lots of lands out really quickly. And with having lots of um, the three color lands from New Capenna, the Leyline Bindings become a one mana instant exile anything, which is really good. And we're basically wanting to build up to either Herd Migration to go really wide on the board with five three three creatures, or bring out a Tali or a Traxa. If you're low on life, you want a Traxa. If you want to increase your board presence, you might want to use a Tali. Obviously, it steals something from the opponent as well. And sometimes you might play an Atali, and off that, you hit a Herd Migration or an Atraxa, and suddenly you've got a hand refilled and a really big board presence. So it's a really, really good deck just for ramping up really quickly. And um, also has some protection from um, early things. We've got Ossification, which can be a uh, not as good as leyline binding but maybe a little bit easier to cast especially at the beginning and uh, we also have archangel of wrath that can do two damage to different targets and can gain you life so that's going to help keep you alive a bit longer if you're against something like a mono red and then obviously we have sunfall as well a good board wipe if it just goes too wide and there's nothing you can do about it because we don't have too many creatures and a lot of them you know attracts that entirely are legendary anyway and Stomper is good as a blocker and good to use, but the main benefit is ramping up. It doesn't really matter if we have to use Sunfall and we lose it. Um, we can always uh, then rebuild pretty quickly. If we have uh, an Atraxa or an Atali, we can rebuild really fast. So again, a really, really fun deck to play with. Kind of expensive considering the Mythics, the Rares. Uh, these are rare, these are rare, these are rare. This is rare, this is rare. And these are the only uncommons in the deck. So pretty expensive and again because we're doing multiple colors we need to have some expensive uh, lands as well all the three color lands are rares and we've also got one boost in here but we don't have very many 
other or any other Kamigawa channel lands because Topiary Stomper and Zendikar can only bring out basic land types. So if we fill our deck with all the other channel lands, which you might think is a good thing considering we have legendary creatures and all different colors, means you're probably going to miss on um, playing Topiary Stomper or Invasion of Zendikar if you have lots of basics out already or you just don't have the, uh, the colors that you need. So it's really important that we have those basics in there. And yeah, so it's pretty expensive again. All of those uh, lands, all of these um, top end cards. So if you have the wild cards and you want to try it out, you can give it a go, but I wouldn't necessarily spend all your wild cards on this. If you're not entirely sure if you'll like it, there is a slight chance that a tractor will be banned in the future, which may or may not happen. But if it does and you've crafted a tractor, then you will get those wild cards back anyway. So that one's not quite so much of a risk if it does get banned. It can deal with the fast aggro format at the moment with a bit of removal. Archangel of Wrath can kill some little creatures and some folk can wipe the board. So it is pretty good against those things. And if you're able to use your Atali to maybe steal the opponent's Atali or a tractor, then it's going to do huge things for you as well. So really powerful deck. Let's move on to number eight. Number eight is a much cheaper deck compared to the last two. We have Selesnia um, Poison or Toxic. So the most important ones in this deck are probably Venerated Rot Priest because it can do toxic damage itself, but it doesn't actually have to attack because whenever a creature you control becomes a target of a spell, then the opponent gets a poison counter. So we can basically just use Rot Priest and get some other creatures out and protect them. And we might not even necessarily need to attack, but there is a plan for that if we do need to. We have Skrelv for protection, because Skrelv is a really great card. We have Crawling Chorus, that if it dies, it can replace itself with another 1-1, one, one, so it's kind of resilient in that way. This version of a deck also uses Light the Way. It's good to have lots of instants that can target your own creatures, so putting a plus one counter on your creature, or returning something to its owner's hand, could be pretty useful. You can use that against, um, you can't use that against the opponent. You can then use it on your own things. But if there's like a board wipe or something and you want to rescue something, that's pretty useful as well. Tyvar Stand gives it uh, hexproof and indestructible, uh, as does Tamiyo Safekeeping and Lauren's Escape. So there's basically a few different ways of protecting your creatures. Uh, we have Skrell's Hive, which is going to make extra mites, which means there's more things for the opponent to target. But also, if they can't deal with them, then they're going to keep hitting through with a little bit more poison, a little bit more poison counters over and over again. And if you happen to have three or more poison counters on the opponent, then all of your creatures with toxic get lifelink. So you have a potential to maybe deal with mono red because mono red will probably not block. And so you should be able to get three poison counters on them relatively easily. And then once you get out things like um, a jawbone duelist or a bloated contaminator with lifelink, then you're probably going to survive at that point. The duelist is really important because it has double strikes, although it's toxic one, it actually does two poison counters when it attacks. And Slaughter Singer can boost everything to give them all plus one, plus one whenever something attacks with toxic and everything we have here has toxic. So everything gets plus one, plus one for the number of Slaughter Singers we have out. One of them will do that once. If we have all four of them, everything's getting plus four, plus four when you attack. Uh, obviously they boost each other as well. They don't boost themselves, but they do boost each other. So if you have two and they both attack, they become plus three. They become three threes. So um, again, toxic two, really great getting two poison counters on the opponent. We have a little bit of removal here with Annex Sentry that can exile artifacts or creatures with mana value three or less. Uh, not as good as a Brutal Cathar, but it is more uh, on brand for the deck because obviously they have toxic themselves. They're an artifact, so they do die to cut down, but they don't die to go for the throat, which is the most common removal we see at the moment. And it only affects things with mana value three or less. But because this deck moves pretty fast, probably fine. You probably don't need to exile shieldreds with it, for, any, for example. And then we have Bloated Contaminator, which is another rare in the deck. I think the only rares we have are that. We have Skrelv and we have Rock Priest. You can do this without Skrelv as well. Oh, and Hive. You can do it without those if you want a cheaper version of a deck. But Bloated Contaminator is really good because we can hit we can do the toxic one damage, but also we can proliferate. So it basically is toxic two effectively. So that can add all kinds of counters on. If we've managed to add a plus one counter on something as well, 
then the proliferate will double that. But it's probably a very small uh, case that where that's actually going to come up. For the mana base for this deck, we do have some rare lands because we want to have two colors as early as possible, considering some things that are great to get out on turn one have white, some other ones are green, and obviously we need green and white for Slaughter Singers. So it's a bit of a mix here of different, um, different colors we need to have available all the time. So we've got um, forests and plains, obviously, but we've got Razor Verge Thicket, which is the faster land. We've got Brush Land, which is the one that does damage to you, the Pain Land, and we have Farmland, which is the one that comes out later on, uh, the slower land that comes out untapped. We've also got Seed Core, which can give a 1-1 one, one creature plus 2 plus 1 uh, until the end of turn if the opponent has three poison counters. So if you put that on maybe a Jawbone Duelist, you might even do lots of damage to the opponent rather than uh, necessarily getting the toxic damage through to them. You might even hit them on hit points. Um, and then we have Myrix as well, which is slightly awkward sometimes because it does tap for colorless if it's not the first turn that it's been played, but it can also make an extra 1-1 one, one might with toxic. So it can increase your board if needed. I probably wouldn't have four of them in there because it does get a little bit awkward with the, uh, the mana base. But uh, they are rare. The Ganjo is rare. Poseidon is rare. The Seed Core is rare. And all these other two color lands are rare as well. So it can be kind of expensive. There are other two color lands you can use that are cheaper. And there's not so many uh, rare cards in the, uh, in the creatures in the main deck. So um, it can be a bit cheaper. And it's a pretty fast, relatively new deck that's come out. So um, it's obviously much easier to craft this if you don't have the cards yet if you want to spend some wild cards on it um i think it's a pretty good deck to play with on to number seven in our top 10 meta decks we have mono black mid-range now this is one that obviously was hit very hard with the ban because almost every version of mono black in fact probably every single version was playing invoke despair before and now the deck has to survive without that incredibly powerful card but we do have lots of other things that are powerful in the deck Evolved Sleeper, which can grow, become Death Touch, and can draw cards. So that's very versatile. Obviously, we have Cut Down, we have Go for the Throat for the main removal. Tenacious Underdog is a good attacker, but also can come back from the graveyard and draw your cards later on. So that's pretty uh, difficult for the opponent to deal with. They have to exile it if they want to get rid of it. Life of Toshiro Umezawa is great for removing these little creatures the opponent might put out, like Thalia and things, because it gives it minus one, minus one. Or you can just gain life if there's nothing that you need to remove. And then when you get that and you flip it, it turns into the memory, which can give you extra black mana to be able to cast instants or sorceries at the expense of one life. Now, that would be really great to cast um, Invoke Despair, but that we do have some other things we can cast here that are going to um, help us out and do a good amount of work, even though Invoke Despair is not there anymore. So, yeah, go for the throat. We have Razor Lash, Transmogrant which can't block, but it can do three damage and it can return from the graveyard to the battlefield with plus one counters. If the opponent has um, four or more non-basic lands, it can also come out very cheaply. And considering some of the other decks like Esper Legends or the five color domain ramp deck probably have lots of um, non-basic lands. In fact, lots of decks have lots of non-basic lands at the moment. It's pretty good that that is cheaper to bring back from the graveyard. So that's really useful too. We've got Graveyard Trespasser, which is a card that I really like because it has Ward Discard a card. Now, normally if something has Ward 1, you have to pay a bit extra, but you can get rid of it. If it has Ward, pay some life. It's not ideal, but some people don't mind sacrificing their life. If you make the opponent discard a card just to kill Trespasser, then it's a two for one automatically. And it's, um, you know, the opponent doesn't want to lose cards to be able to kill things. So quite often... You'd want to get rid of this with some kind of board wipe rather than targeting it. So it's quite a resilient threat for you to use against the opponent. Also, Graveyard Hate is really useful, especially when opponents have uh, things like Atraxa and Natalis in the graveyard. And if your opponent has something like Tenacious Underdog, then you can remove it with a Graveyard Trespasser and it gains a little bit of life, which is kind of useful too. We have Liliana, which again, making the opponent discard things, if they might have to discard something, to kill the Graveyard Trespasser. They don't want to have to discard more things to Liliana. So those two work together really well. But also making the opponent sacrifice a creature 
gets around ward abilities. So if your opponent has a graveyard trespasser out and you put out Liliana, you can make them sacrifice it without having to pay the ward cost. So Liliana works out pretty well. The only time you might not want to do it is if you're making yourself discard too many cards. But depending on what you have, we have things like cut down that might not be useful against the opponent if they only have big creatures. Tenacious Underdog or Razor Lash can go into the graveyard and still come back later on if needed. So it's not entirely wasted if you discard one of those. So Liliana can be a pretty difficult thing to deal with, especially if you manage to remove all of the opponent's creatures every time they play out one, you pretty much make them sacrifice it. So it really slows things down if they can't kill it. Got a couple of Archfiend of the Dross in this deck, which is really good. A six, uh, six, six flying creature that only costs four. The downside of it is that you might lose in four turns if you don't win by that point or if you don't kill it. So it's one that your opponent wants to deal with pretty quickly because a 6-6 six, six flyer is a big threat, especially on turn four. But if they don't deal with it and they let it stay around, it's going to do lots of damage to them. And then if you absolutely have to, you probably can uh, use, um, where is it? Uh, use go for the throat to kill it if you need to. If it's going to be, if you're going to lose next turn, you can kill it. And with Liliana, you can also use um, use her to get rid of Archfiend, which I haven't seen many people do, but it is a potential thing where it says target player sacrifices a creature. You can target yourself and then remove Archfiend if you need to. They've got Sorin, which is a great Planeswalker for bringing extra cards out of your um, library. Works even better when you have lots of low cost cards because you're paying life equal to the mana value of the card that you're drawing. So majority of things here are one, two or three. So that's pretty good. And if it's a land, then obviously you don't pay any life at all. So drawing extra cards each turn is great. Making the two, three vampire with lifelink is OK if you really need something on the board. I probably wouldn't do that most of the time if you have anything else blocking, because if you can just plus Sorin three times and get him to seven loyalty, you could do 13 damage to any target and gain 13 life. Most likely it's going to be the opponent's face that you hit for 13 damage and you gain 13. It's really going to swing the battle um, quite significantly. So Sorin could do some really good work. We have Shield Red. There's only two in this version of the deck, which is kind of surprising because you almost definitely want Shield Red out. Um, but obviously, amazing card. You know what it does. And then we have Gix's Command as the kind of top end of this deck. Rather than Invoke Despair, we can pretty much board wipe the opponent if we need to, we can put plus one counters and lifelink onto something of ours. Maybe we want to put it on a shield red or a graveyard trespasser or on the archfiend because that's already a 6-6. Six, six. So it can do lots of damage and it can destroy lots of creatures on the opponent's side, bring things back from your graveyard. Um, yeah, so it can do all kinds of things. It's a very versatile card to have at the top end. We can use life of Toshiro, the, the flip side of it, the memory of Toshiro, we can use to pay life to spend one black mana to add one black mana to be able to cast Gix's command so it makes it a little bit cheaper as well which is really useful so it's still a good deck it still gets good win rates but it's not as good without invoke despair obviously the lands for this deck are much cheaper we have a mirix in this version which i don't know if it's really that necessary i guess there's not that much of a downside um you're probably going to be able to cast anything you need even with a mirix in the uh, mana base it gives you the ability to add a toxic one one might i don't know if that's really going to do that much for you but it's there if um if we need to add one extra little creature um majority are just basic lands and we have a couple of takanumas um having one in the deck is absolutely no downside having two there's a chance that you draw them both and you need them both for the land but it's pretty unlikely uh but you can also bring things back from the graveyard if they've died and it costs less if you've got um, some legendary creatures out, which we only have shielded here. But still, um, really good, even for three or four mana. So a little bit cheaper on the lands, but there's still lots of rares in the main deck. We've got Evolve Sleeper, Underdog, Liliana is uh, Mythic, Archfiend there, Gigs' Command, <laughs> Sorin, Shieldred, Graveyard Trespasser, and the Razor Lash Transmogrant. So pretty much everything apart from Life of Tashiro. Uh, cut down and go for the throat. Everything else is rare. So black does tend to be a kind of expensive deck, but it's one that I've used for a long time. I've done lots with mono black, especially when Invoke Despair was a thing. But even now, it's still fun to play with, and it's still good for the majority of decks. 
the matchups you might have because you have so much removal you can add more than just a three cut downs and a three go for the throat i'd probably add some edicts or maybe even infernal grasp to kill some artifact creatures um so yeah a great a great deck to play with really fun still slightly expensive and at number six we have azorius soldiers which is a relatively new deck where most of the cards that have boosted this have come out of brothers war or dominaria we've got the valiant veteran that boosts other soldiers which didn't see very much play until these other things came out in brothers war because we've got Miral, which is um a difficult one to deal with because it can make lots of extra soldiers siege veteran and sky strike officer and harbin all came out in brothers war so they all um, have boosted valiant veteran or worked well together to make this deck happen um, to start with, we've got Recruitment Officer, which can also, apart from being a 2-1 one for 1, which is good, it's a soldier, so it benefits from all the other um, boosts and synergies. You can also get a creature mana value 3 or less from the top um, top 4 cards of your library, which is the majority of our creatures, so it's almost always going to hit if you need it. But I don't see many people actually use it, because I don't think they need to. But if you do, it's there. Uh, we've got the Frontliner, which is... Um, a nice little attacker by itself it's a soldier obviously and it also can add plus one onto something else so it's kind of like a two two they can get two damage through and you can unearth it as well to bring it back so it's kind of resilient a little bit annoying to deal with and we've got thalia because most of the things in fact all of the things in this deck are creatures we don't have any instants or sorceries so making non-creature spells cost more is only going to tax your opponent so it's kind of annoying when you face it but it's really useful when it's on your side Resolute reinforcements can make two creatures, in fact, two soldiers, and at instant speed. So it's great to use on your opponent's turn when they don't know what's going to happen and you manage to play them out. Um, we've got Valiant Veteran. If we have that out already, in fact, Resolute Reinforcements gets a lot better because we're not just making two one ones at instant speed. We can make two two twos at instant speed, which can potentially be good blockers against the opponent if they're attacking with something even relatively big. Um, obviously Valiant Veteran is going to boost everything and is really good. You can also exile it from your graveyard, but plus one counter on each soldier you control. So you even get some value when it gets killed and it will be a, a big target for your opponent to deal with once you put one out. And if you have more than one, because they're not legendary, that all stacks. So that all gets really good with Valiant Veterans. And then Harbin is a good way to finish the game off because whenever you attack with five or more soldiers, everything gets plus one, plus one and gains flying. So depending on what the opponent has, if they can't deal with flying, you might hit them with Thalia, you might hit them with Resolute Reinforcements. It's actually kind of easy to get five creatures out. And um, even if you bring back the Frontliner from the graveyard, you can get five creatures out pretty easily. And then obviously Harbin comes out. In fact, you don't even have to attack with Harbin. So if you have five other creatures out, play Harbin and then just attack with everything else. You're probably going to win on that attack. So Harbin, big target to deal with once it comes out. Um, it does die to cut down if we don't have a Valiant Veteran. But if you do, then it's suddenly a 4-3 and it's a little bit harder to kill. Uh, we have Brutal Cathar as one of the main um, removals. In fact, it is the main removal in this deck where uh, you're going to take basically anything the opponent has that's a problem for you and you can just exile it, which is great fun. If you don't cast anything on your turn or the opponent doesn't cast anything on their turn, then it does flip over to the Moon Rage Brute, which gets the ability of First Strike and Ward Pay 3 Life, but it's no longer a human soldier. It's just a werewolf. So it does mean it loses the extra synergies we have from other soldier cards here. But being able to flip it onto the Knight side and then flip it back by playing maybe two cheap cards then we can basically exile something else. So it's really versatile to be able to exile more than one thing. Obviously, it's good to get rid of the opponent's tokens uh, because they don't come back if Brutal Cathar dies. But it's also good just to take out any big thing. I wouldn't take anything that is a prototype because it comes back as a bigger version. You don't want to take anything like, uh, well, ideally, you don't want to have to take anything with a big ETB effect like Itali. But if there's an Itali there, you probably have to deal with it one way or another. But once Brutal Cathar dies and that comes back, it's going to be a big pain for you. and You're going to lose the game. So Brutal Cathar is pretty good removal. Uh, we have Siege Veteran, which makes things a bit more resilient because we can add plus one counters on creatures. And if a non-token soldier we control dies, we create another token soldier to replace it. 
So pretty much everything here is a soldier. It's non-token apart from resolute reinforcements making a token copy. Um, and the tokens you get from Siege Veteran and from Miral. But apart from that, when they remove something, it's going to be replaced by a 1-1. So it's definitely something you need to kill first. Your opponent needs to kill first if you're playing this. Um, but again, um, another good soldier that came out in Brothers War. And then Sky Strike Officer. It's a flyer. It's 2-3. And when it attacks, you can make another 1-1 soldier artifact token, which is really useful. But also, you can tap three untapped soldiers you control to draw a card. Now, you don't need to tap um, Sky Strike Officer to do this, so it, it can do it on the first turn it comes out, um, and it doesn't cost any mana. It's just tapping the soldiers. You can do it more than once. So if you have six soldiers out at the end of the opponent's turn, if they haven't attacked, you've got six remaining. You can just basically draw two cards for nothing. So it's a great way of giving you a bit of card advantage, and it's the only other thing that's blue apart from having Harbin. So it's, this is why Mono White Soldiers works pretty well as well. But I think a Sky Strike Officer is a really useful addition to the deck. And then Mirror, which can be really annoying for your opponent, especially if there's something like Mono Blue, because the opponent cannot cast spells or activate abilities um, on your turn. So they have to play everything on their turn, which can really mess up the opponent's plans. And um, when it attacks, you can make X 1 1 soldiers for the number of soldiers you control. So the number of soldiers you control includes the tokens. So if you attack with Mirror, you're doing lots of damage, um, you're making lots of tokens, and you're going to then make more tokens on the next turn. It's going to basically double again, grow exponentially, if you manage to attack a few times with Miral. So again, something that you really need to get rid of if your opponent puts it down. So it's a pretty good one for you to have it in the deck. Then for the mana base, we do have a few rare lands in the deck because we want to have access to both colors. So we've got uh, some blue white lands fortified beachhead is a land that's made specifically for the soldier deck so obviously include that one if you have the uh, wild cards you can also include plaza of heroes to be any color but also protect uh, legendary cards you have so harbin is legendary and mural is legendary as well so you might need that for protection but i don't think it's necessary i don't see everyone playing plaza of heroes in their soldier decks uh, but Secluded Courtyard is one that's really good as well because it's good for basically any tribal deck where you're making, um, when you have more than one color and everything is uh, has a creature type in common, you can just play this out and select Soldiers as your creature and it will help you basically fix your mana for drawing, for being able to play Harbin and Sky Strike Officer as well. So not quite as expensive on the um, on the lands. There are still quite a few rares here in the actual main deck. Thalia, Brutal Cathar, Miral, Siege Veteran, Sky Strike, Harbin, Valiant Veteran. We've only got Resolute Reinforcements, Frontliner, and Recruitment Officer that are the uncommons here. So again, still quite expensive. There are quite a lot of expensive decks. But you're going to get lots of use out of these, especially considering we don't have rotation happening in September this year for these cards. So Brutal Cathar is hanging around longer. Thalia is hanging around longer and um all these other ones are new ones anyway but these ones if you're going to have to craft them and use your rare wild cards if you don't have them already it's going to be around for a while and obviously all the new cards here they're going to be around for an extra year so i think it's probably a pretty good investment if you have the cards for it in at number five we have rakdos control this is one that's really really um been disadvantaged by the bands because some of the biggest win rate versions of the deck literally used um, Reckon the Bank Buster and Fable and Invoke Despair. So um, it's obviously not having any of those cards is a big disadvantage to the deck, but it does still has lots of strong threats in it. So it's still a really big contender and it's number five in the top 10 meta decks at the moment. So that's no surprise there. We've got Cut Down, we've got Go for the Throat for our removal. Blood Tithe Harvester is still good. Uh, not as good without Fable, but it's still good because we can make blood tokens to fix our hand and we can sacrifice it to remove things if needed. So that's obviously really good. We've got a braid to deal with smaller threats or artifacts and Shouldred's Edict that can deal with Planeswalkers or other creatures with Ward or just general removal. We've got a uh, Riveter's Requisitioner here, which is a card that you don't see as often. or Maybe it's a new addition to the deck. It's from New Capenna, so it's not a new card. But when it dies, you manage to you get to create a treasure token. 
and you can blitz it as well uh, to give it haste, do some damage. But I guess most of the time you want to play this for two. It's a three one, which is not too bad for two, especially if the opponent can't um, deal with it. But once they do deal with it, you get a treasure back, which helps you ramp. So that's pretty useful. Uh, we've got Brotherhood's End to deal with lots of little creatures. And Professional Facebreaker is one, again, I don't see many people use, but it's in this version of the deck. Whenever one or more creatures you control deal combat damage to the player, you can create another treasure token. And you can exile treasure tokens to, um, you can sacrifice treasure tokens to exile the top card of your library to play this turn. Um, I probably wouldn't want to necessarily use that ability unless we've got um, lots of mana out already and the ability to cast an Atali or uh, Breach the Multiverse, because you don't want to just reveal that top card and, and waste it. So I guess maybe just for creating the treasure tokens, this is uh, the main benefit of Professional Face Breaker. This is all kind of trying to replace the ability of Fable to make the treasure tokens with the Goblin. And we have Shield Red, because it's a black deck. Why would it not have Shield Red? We have Big Score that works really well with Shield Red, because you can not only fix your hand in a way a bit like the second chapter of fable um but you can also draw two cards which works well with children because you're going to gain four life from that and create treasure tokens to help wrap up um if we manage to do some of these things with uh chandra hope speaking out then we get to double them so doing big score uh where you only have to discard one thing and you draw four cards and create four treasure tokens is not bad considering you're only paying four to do it in the first place so obviously that works really well together. Uh, we've got Atsushi here, which again, another big threat in the sky, and it can create more treasure tokens. So I guess this deck is really trying to make as much treasure as possible to cast uh, Chandra and Atali and breach the multiverse as quickly as possible. We've got the new shield red here, which is uh, normally you see this included as one of. You don't seem to find many people putting lots in. It's a little bit more expensive to cast than the apocalypse. And it also is slightly less versatile in a way but if the opponent does have lots of things in their graveyard being able to flip this over into the true scriptures i have uh obviously you get to destroy things the opponent has to discard three cards and mill three cards and then there's lots and lots of things in the graveyard now anytime i've played this the opponent either uh scoops before you get to chapter three um or they might be able to remove it before it gets there but i've never seen anyone wait to see chapter three happen um, because if all the creatures from all the graveyards come out onto your battlefield, then that's going to be insane. Um, so it seems like a good one to include, although I don't know if you very often get to flip it. So it's kind of just like opponent sacrifices one thing and you have a menace creature out. So it's OK. It's not as good as the other one. Then we've got Cruelty of Gix, which is really important, especially for um, mirror matches where the opponent might have an Atali or something like an Atraxa in the graveyard, because you can basically steal it with chapter three. But also where we've got the ability to sacrifice some things, this is like what you would do with Fable, you would sacrifice an Atali or discard an Atali to the graveyard, draw another card, and then once you get Cruelty of Gix, you can bring back Atali um, straight away once we get that. Having a uh, Requisitioner and Facebreaker and a Sushi and Big Score helps us basically get the land that we're gonna need, the mana that we need, to cast Cruelty of Gigs. So it's going to do lots of work for us. I don't think you see many people casting on uh, Chapter 1 these days because they either just want to find a card. Um, if you've got enough mana and you just want, to, just want to find a Breach the Multiverse, that makes sense. If you don't and you just have an Atali in the graveyard, then you just jump straight to Chapter 3. So that's really versatile. Chandra copying instants and sorceries is great. So it means like go for the throat can kill two things instead. Big score can draw lots of extra cards. Um, we could even potentially use Brotherhood's End to do um, six damage to all creatures and planeswalkers. That would probably kill Chandra, so you might not want to do that, but it's uh, it's there if you need it. Um, but also, it can just do direct damage, which is really useful. And then copying Breach the Multiverse is um, basically the game's over by that point. If they've if you've milled twenty cards on both sides, and you get to put out basically four creatures or planeswalkers from the battlefields out without any extra cost. The game's basically over there, especially if you've got Natalia there. It's just going to, the board's going to be full up with everything. Um, so that's the main plan of this deck, really. Get lots of treasure, get Chandra out, maybe breach the multiverse twice, and then the game's over. So it's still a really strong deck, even without Invoke Despair. For the mana base, obviously you want to have two colors again. So we've got um, 
but you can have some three color lands from a new Capenna. Green's not needed, but we do need to have red and black as uh, reliably as uh, as we can because we have Blood Tithe Harvester needs both and we have some things like Brotherhood's Hand, Asushi, uh, Shield Red and Gix and Chandra. In fact, loads of things here need two of each color. So you want to make sure you definitely have um, two available. OK, so um, it's not quite as important, actually, as it was before, because Invoke Despair was obviously four black to be able to cast, but uh, it's still pretty important. So you want to get as many of these um, rare lands as possible. And then obviously, like I said before, rares in the deck, we have all these are rare, 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 mythic. Big score is common and we have a couple of uncommon things with Blood Tithe, Harvester, Cut Down, Go for the Throat and a Braid and Edict and Requisitioner. But Face Breaker, Shield Red, Atsushi, and all these things up here are rare mythic. So again, kind of expensive, but they're going to be around for a while. So maybe it's not too bad to cast uh, to craft them. I think they'll be good additions to your collection if you don't have them already. And then we have um, number four in our roundup, which is listed here as Mono White Soldiers. But to be honest, if you're playing Copper Coat Vanguard and you're not playing a Valiant Veteran, it's not a soldier's deck, it's a human's deck. There's just lots of overlap. So let's have a look at the other humans in the deck that are going to be boosted by Copper Coat Vanguard, which is a new uncommon from Aftermath. It's a really good one to craft if you don't have it already. So the main, um, the main benefit of this deck, the main aim of this deck, is just to flood the board as much as possible with humans that get stronger and stronger. So Hopeful Initiate is a 1-2 that can train, so it can add counters onto itself. Um, we've got Recruitment Officer, which is a 2-1, which can, again, find creatures, mana value 3 or less uh, on the top of your library in the top four cards. The majority of the creatures in the deck are 3 or less, so there's a good chance that's always going to hit if you ever need it. We've got one Skrell for protection, but not so many because it's not a human, uh, and it's not going to advance the rest of the plan of the deck, but obviously it's good to have it uh, in some cases as a bit of protection. Uh, Copper Coat Vanguard will give everything else plus one to their power and ward one. So all the other humans we have that we're going to go through are going to get stronger and be more protected. It's not legendary, so it does stack. So if you have four Copper Coat Vanguards out, they're going to give each other and all the other creatures you have, uh, well, up to plus four and ward four effectively. So um, really great card to have in this kind of human tribal deck. We've got Guardian of New Benalia, which can enlist and can scry, and it could become indestructible if needed. So it's a really difficult threat to deal with and can do lots of damage. We've got an Intrepid Adversary, a good one to come out later on, because you can add plus one counters onto everything else you have, or you not counters, you can add Valor counters onto Intrepid Adversary, which can basically give all the other creatures plus one, plus one um, for each Valor counter. So it's not the same as plus one counters. If Intrepid Adversary dies, then the boost to the other creatures goes away. But it also has lifelink, which is pretty useful. It's kind of easy to kill. But apart from the fact that it's a human, you can possibly give it um, Ward 1 with Copper Coat Vanguards or protect it with Skrelv if you happen to have it. So although it's good to bring out later and it could potentially die, there are some ways we can protect it. We've got Thalia again, because is it everything? Yes, everything in this deck is a creature. So we're not losing out at all by making non-creature spells cost one more. Adeline is a human that makes more humans. Um, it's nice to have a 1-1 one, one that comes out when you attack, when you attack with anything. But it's even better if you have some Copper Coat Vanguards out and it becomes a 2-1 or a 3-1. And it's not quite so easy for the opponent just to block it. So you're going to make your board a lot wider by having Adeline out. Uh, Anointed Peacekeeper is, again, a human like everything else in the deck pretty much. But it can also take something from your opponent's hand or make it. It doesn't take it from the hand, but it makes it more expensive to cast. So you can just choose something from their hand. Normally, this ends up just being their removal, because if the opponent has a go for the throat and you choose something else as the thing that anointed peacekeeper is going to tax, then all the opponent has to do is destroy the peacekeeper. So it becomes a magnet for removal. But if you can make the removal cost more, then it's going to be harder to get rid of Peacekeeper and harder to get rid of other things. So that's when that's most useful. Vigilance is obviously really good and giving it the plus one and ward from uh, the Copper Coat Vanguard uh, makes it a lot better. We've 
got Brutal Cathar because, yes, that's the removal. Like we said before, it can flip and flip back to remove other things. That's really useful. Um, because we have lots of overlap between soldiers and humans, the Siege Veteran works really well in this deck as well, even though the um, second part, the second part of the, uh, the text on Siege Veteran is whenever a non-token soldier you control dies, create a 1-1 one, one, um, soldier token. Well, to be honest, um, we have Initiate is not a soldier, but Recruitment Officer is. Coppercoat Vanguard is, so this is why it crosses both humans and soldiers. Uh, Guardian is a soldier. Intrepid Adversary is not. Thalia is. Um, Adeline is. Oh, Adeline's not, sorry. Adeline's just a knight. Uh, Peacekeeper is a cleric. And Brutal Cathar is a soldier, unless it's flipped onto the red side, in which case it's just a werewolf. So it does kind of work pretty well. And just being able to add plus one counters on things every turn in itself is a good ability. So um, still a good include in the deck. And then we have Knight Errant of Eos, which is a great spell, especially a great creature to have, especially when you have a wide board because you can convoke it, which means you can basically cast it for free if you have five creatures that you don't mind tapping to cast it. And you can also look at the top six of your library and reveal up to two creature cards with mana value equal to the number of creatures that convoked this turn to help it cast. So because pretty much everything here is three, you only really need to pay uh, to convoke three creatures um, onto Knight Errant of Aeos, which means it only costs two mana or two lands, three creatures, and you can draw three, uh, draw two cards. So two mana, tap three creatures, you're getting a four, four and two extra cards in your hand. Um, that's a good deal. So obviously really good. You don't want to have lots of them in there because you don't want to draw them early. And the more of them you have in the deck, the harder it is to actually get the ability off them because you want to have creatures that equal the amount of um, convoke that you've done there. And if you hit another knight errant, then you need to have convoked five, which is a bit harder to do. So and uh, it's a human, so it gains the benefit of the Vanguard, but it's not a soldier, so it doesn't gain the benefit of a siege veteran. So obviously, lots and lots of creatures. We can protect things, and we just want to keep putting things out, boosting everything as much as possible with Adversary and Vanguard and um, and Siege Veteran, and then just keep attacking. So it's a really good kind of aggro deck here. Uh, not very much removal, because we're basically relying on Brutal Cathar, and that's basically it. Although Hopeful Initiate can destroy uh, artifacts or enchantments, which includes artifact creatures or enchantment creatures. So I guess that is kind of useful. Um, and works well with Siege Veteran because you can take off plus one counters from things and Siege Veteran adds them on. For the mana base for this deck, it's obviously much cheaper, which is nice because it's just one color. So the majority of the lands are just planes. You can include a Foundry if you want as an extra potential attacker. There's not really a downside to that. And having a Ganjo Seat of the Empire, there's not really a downside to that either. It's discounted for legendary creatures. And we have Thalia and Adeline are both legendary creatures anyway so it's going to make this cost only one mana if you have both of those out uh, in order to do four damage to an attacking or blocking creature so it's great removal in fact i probably have another one of those in there at least um, if you've got it because there's a good chance you're going to want to use one of them at some point for a removal um, so yeah a much cheaper deck in comparison obviously there are still rares uh, rare hopeful initiate guardian is rare Adversary is mythic, Thalia is rare, Siege Veteran is rare, Brutal Cathar is rare, Anointed Peacekeeper, Adeline and Eos. Actually, maybe it's not as cheap as I thought it was, but Coppercoat Vanguard is the one that makes us work the most. Recruitment Officer is uncommon as well. So yeah, actually, I guess there's lots of rares and mythics in this deck as well. Just the mana base is cheaper. So you could probably make a version of the deck that's a bit more budget friendly if you just don't have so many of these um, rare mythic cards and have a few more uncommon or common humans that are going to work out well with Copper Coat Vanguard. So that's the most important one in the deck. So maybe a little bit cheaper than some other decks. At number three, we have, I guess, the most annoying deck to play against, unless you really hate Mono Red. Uh, the most annoying deck to play against because it stops you from doing the things that you want to do. Now, this one is actually a lot cheaper. In fact, this one, although it could have um, the rare land in there as well, this one only needs four rares, and you could, in theory, do it with less. But Haughty Gin is basically the whole point of this deck. You want to get the gin out, protect it, 
and it basically just becomes really strong because you have lots of cheap instants and sorceries that end up in your graveyard and it does lots and lots of damage it's not unusual for this to be a a 10 4 flyer that essentially costs three mana to put out also it discounts your other instants and sorceries so it makes them all much easier to cast so all of these two mana um instants here become one so it makes it so much cheaper we also have Telerian Terror, which is the only other creature in the whole deck. So when you have four Jinns, four Terrors, they cost seven mana to put out if you don't have any instants or sorceries in your graveyard, but you will have. There's no way you'll have this and not have instants and sorceries in the graveyard. And it becomes one less to cast for each of those, so it can go down to just one blue for a 5-5 five, five Ward 2 creature, which most of the time is there just to block the opponent and uh, stall things out so you can damage them with the Jinn but can also be the attacker, uh, especially if you have two or three of these out and you just attack with all of them. It's quite difficult for your opponent to deal with if you do. Um, the way we get there, the way we stay alive with this deck is by countering things and stalling. So it's basically a tempo deck. We want to um, counter non-creature spells your opponent plays, um, look for things on top of our um, hand, on uh, top of our library, and we can put things into the graveyard as well. So if you hit consider, and you find a, an instant or sorcery that you don't really want, don't necessarily want, maybe you have a, a spell pierce against a creature deck, then you can consider put the spell pierce in the graveyard, and now you've got two more instants in the graveyard, which helps Jin and helps Terra as well. So consider works really well here. Fading Hope puts things of your opponent's back in their hand, or kills tokens, and allows you to scry, so that's really useful. Slip out the back is a way of protecting your own creatures from board wipes, or any other direct removal. Fading Hope can also be used to protect a Jinn or a Terra if it's going to be destroyed. It's normally better to protect them rather than letting them die. We've got Impulse, which can look at the top four of your library and put things into your hands so you can find the card that you need. Essence Scatter to uh, counter creatures, make disappear to counter anything, especially in the early game. And also um, first, first for Discovery, which can draw three and discard two or just one if you have too many lands in your hand, which generally is the case. You only need to have pretty much three or four lands out in order to make this deck work really well. So any extra lands you have, you can chuck in the graveyard or you can discard two instants. And basically with Thirst for Discovery going into the graveyard for three mana, you're putting three instants in the graveyard, which can really help out Jen or make Terra much cheaper as well. So this works really well in the deck. And then we also have Flow of Knowledge, which can draw, an, uh, draw a card for each island you control and then discard two cards. This is basically the only reason for not having the other rare land in the deck and only having islands. It means you're going to draw one extra card rather than having the ability to use that, that legendary land as a, a fading hope. So with only one Flow of Knowledge in the deck, I don't know if it makes that much difference, really. Um, There's not a very high chance you're going to play that every game. Maybe if you have more flow of knowledge, you want to keep the mana base cheaper. But either way, like it's going to draw lots of cards. You probably will refill your hand by this point. Because although it can be cheaper when you have a gin out, you're probably going to draw at least five cards here and discard two, which is uh, pretty much refilling your hand and getting rid of things you don't need. So it's a great way to kind of pretty much finish off the game. Because once you've done that, put some more things in the graveyard, gin gets stronger, and you've got the counter spells or the protection spells you need to finish off the game. So really annoying to play against, but kind of fun. A little bit harder to uh, actually control. Not as easy as something that's just play out all your creatures and keep attacking. You do have to think about when you're using your counter spells and um, making sure you have what you need to protect the gin before you play it. You don't want to play a gin when you only have three lands because then you have no protection for it. So you want to make sure you at least have um, an extra land out by the time you play this. So turn four at the earliest. So yeah, really good deck to play with so much cheaper because you only have these four rares and don't even need the rare land if you don't want to have it um, and you could potentially do this without the gin if you want to have a deck that doesn't take any rare wild cards at all but i think this uh this is going to be around for a while it's from dominaria so it doesn't go for like another two and a half years and it's um it's always going to find a place in the deck because you're always going to have loads of little blue spells that um that work with this deck so i think it's going to be around for a long time so of all the decks so far we've seen this is probably the best investment in terms of in terms of wild cards 
So it only takes four if you don't have it already. And I think it'll be around for a long time. So that's number three. At number two in the top 10, we have Selesnia Enchantments. This is pretty much made up of cards just from Kamigawa. This is how it was like a year ago when this was a deck that a pretty good budget deck that I would use. We have Jukai Naturalist to make enchantments cheaper. We have Kami of Transience to add plus one counters and trample. We have Weaver of Harmony to copy um, triggers from enchantments. And then we also have Spirited Companion to draw cards. Generous Visitor to add plus one uh, counters onto target creatures. And then we'd have other things like Borrowed Time as extra removal. And Ossification is a new one, but it's pretty much the same as Borrowed Time or um, the other uh, Touch the Spirit Realm and the other enchantment removal cards that we had. But we've got some new things that have updated this deck. The most important one being Calyx Guided by Fate. This is the deck that this is the card that now makes the deck a lot better than it was before. And you could get to Mythic with it before. So whenever an enchanted creature you control deals combat damage to a player or Calyx deals combat damage to a player. You can create a token that's a copy of a non-legendary enchantment you control. Now, none of the enchantments here are legendary, so you can basically copy anything. And the enchantments we have are Spirited Companions that will draw cards, Audacity that will uh, potentially draw cards once it gets removed, but just gives things plus two and trample. Jukai Naturalist is an enchantment. Ossification is an enchantment, so we can remove something else. Reign of Truth is an enchantment, so we can basically get this extra plus one onto things. And we also have, um, so that works really well in itself. We also have in this deck, it's not one I've seen very often, and it does work in a deck by itself if you just add counters without the enchantments. But we also have a botanical brawler in the deck because it's a trampler. It comes out as a 2 2 because it's got counters on top of it. Now, whenever plus one counters are put on another permanent, if it's the first time, it, you basically get to put a plus one counter on Brawler as well. So um, Kami of Transience add pl adds plus one counters, Generous Vista adds plus one counters, and Calyx will add plus one counters whenever enchantments enter the battlefield. So we can put counters all over the place, uh, basically. So they all trigger with enchantments. So if we have Generous Vista out and Kami of Transience and Calyx, and even if it's just, just one visitor, you play any enchantment, even a spirited companion, you're going to draw a card. You get to put three plus one counters wherever you want, and you'll get three additional plus one counters on the brawler, which has trample, so it's difficult to deal with. And then you could also give it the boost from Reign of Truth once you have lots of other enchantments out. Um, normally, we would put the Reign of Truth uh, boost onto Kami of Transience because that has trample, and if it dies, it can come back um, to your hand from the graveyard if another enchantment goes to the graveyard. Uh, normally you would put it on that, or you could put it on a Jukai Naturalist to basically gain lots of life. But now we have other ways of trampling because we're using Audacity to give things trample. And we have Botanical Brawler, which can trample. So once you get a Reign of Truth out, and most of the other things you have out are enchantments, then it's going to give a really big boost to something. And if you even have a Weaver of Harmony, you can tap it and pay one green to copy the plus one ability that Reign of Truth gives the things. So it's going to get pretty much plus two, plus two for each artifact or enchantment you control. So it's going to give it a huge, huge boost. And if you're attacking with something with Audacity, it's an enchanted creature. So Calyx will make a copy of something and it goes around in circles and it just spirals out of control really quickly, adding lots of counters and making lots of copies of things and lots of ways to draw cards, lots of ways to remove things. So it's a really, really versatile deck that was good before. But it's even better now, a lot better now we've got Calyx added from um, Aftermath. There aren't necessarily lots of rares in the deck, or you can do it without too many rares, but Calyx is a mythic. And um, Kami of Transience is a rare, Weaver of Harmony is a rare. And I think that's all the rares in the deck. Weaver of Harmony, Kami of Transience, and Calyx. So everything else is an uncommon or a common. So it's a bit easier to craft compared to some of the other ones. Um, for the mana base, we do want to have a few two color lands, though. So those are going to be um, an extra wild card expense. Overgrown farmlands, raise the verge thicket. You can also have the uh, brush land, the pain land, the one that does damage to you when you tap it for um, white or green, because we have naturalist that can gain life. Um, there's not anything else that can gain life. So I guess it's a little bit tricky um, paying the extra life to get the, uh, the colors that you want if you don't have anything to gain life back. But 
um, if you do then obviously it's going to counteract all that so it's quite difficult to race this deck as well if you're against someone else with an aggro deck they need to be gaining life because once they hit you and get your life total down you hit them you gain some more life from a naturalist it's going to basically um, cancel out the opponent's attack so difficult to race there's, lot, there's lots of other cards you could add into this and other ones that have been um, have left out of this version of a deck in fact one that i've i'll show you one that i used a lot uh, Catilda works really well. It's legendary. Uh, it does become a legendary enchantment, so you can't copy it with Calyx. But being able to give something of yours plus X plus X for the number of permanents you control that are spirits or enchantments, then uh, and obviously flying and lifelink and protection from vampires if that happens to come up. Well, pretty much everything we have here, if it's not an enchantment, it is a spirit. And Kami of Transience is a spirit as well. So everything is basically enchantments or spirits. So um, Katilda is going to do a lot for you as well. Maybe include one of them in the deck. Um, I probably would, but again, it's rare. Um, but yeah, not so expensive for wild cards like the other ones. And pretty fun deck that really snowballs out of control pretty quickly. So I think it's definitely one to, uh, to try out. And then we have the top meta deck, or at least the most popular deck at the moment. And there's many variations of this. But we have mono red, mono red aggro or red deck wins or whatever you want to call it. The most important thing with the red deck is to get out lots of little creatures as fast as possible to do as much damage as possible. So Phoenix Chick um, is a 1-1, one, one. it's flying, it's haste, can come back from the graveyard as a 2-2 two, two if, um, if the right conditions are met. If you attack with three creatures and pay two red mana, which isn't too difficult to do. We've got Swift Spear, which is a really great card for this. It has prowess, so you add plus one, plus one. It has haste, and it can be, um, you can protect it a bit from other like damage spells because you can boost the toughness up. And um, so, yeah, it's a bit resilient. It's pretty fun. Uh, also, with Kamano faces Carcassonne, um, it's a really good legendary, not a really good enchantment, not legendary, but it can add. A plus one counter onto something that you play on its second chapter so adding an extra plus one counter onto a phoenix chick or a swift spear is really good because they're going to be around for a while and then becomes its own two two haste threat in standard in alchemy it's lost the haste because i guess it's just kind of too good so that's a good sign that you should use something in standard if it's been um somewhat uh tweaked or rebalanced in alchemy then Wizards of the Coast have decided it's a little bit too powerful and they want to make it uh, less prominent. So definitely a good one to include in this deck. Play with fire. Obviously, you want to have either as removing the opponent's blockers or at the end of the game to do the final few points of damage. And the festivities will deal with lots of creatures that have one toughness. Um, so very good to have that out. Also does an extra damage to the opponent. Uh, we have Felden, which is a rare in the deck. It can't block, it has haste, and whenever the opponent does damage to it, you can look at some cards from the top of your library equal to the amount of damage that's dealt to it and play one of the next turn. So it's legendary. You kind of want the opponent to block it and um, have to deal with it, and then you get extra card advantage, especially if you've got more than one Felden in your hand. Three in a deck is probably enough. You don't want to have too many at once. Uh, we've got Bloodthirsty Adversary, which, again, is just a 2-2 two -two haste for two, but it can... You can pay extra mana to get a, an instant or sorcery from your graveyard and cast that again. So um, again, really good at the end of the game to be able to cast something. It has to be mana value three or less though. So obviously Stoke the Flames is not going to do it. And these other things aren't instants or sorceries. So it has to be one of the things we have in the first two columns here. Then we've got Lightning Strike, three damage normally to the opponent's face. It's really useful having four of these. It's kind of a no-brainer for the deck. We've got Reckless Impulse, which works well with Swift Spear because it's a non-creature spell. So it triggers prowess and it gives you an extra two cards you can play um, for your next turn, up to the end of your next turn. So a bit more card advantage and it helps things out anyway. We've got Squee, which if it isn't dealt with immediately, starts making extra goblins and um, really widens the board of creatures that you have and can come back from the graveyard if you exile things. Uh, other cards from your graveyard and you'll probably have um, at least some play with fires or a lightning strike in your graveyard or end the festivities or a reckless impulse because you use them they go straight to the graveyard your opponent might have killed a swift spear or something or a felden so 
Not too difficult to exile things from your graveyard if you need to, to bring it back. Then we've got Mechanized Warfare. I don't normally use this in my uh, red aggro decks, but it is really good if you've got um, uh, lots of creatures that come out, especially with Scree and all these other little things, because instead of doing one damage, they're going to do um, two damage. And if you have more Mechanized Warfares out, they do more. So it makes End the Festivities become a mini board wipe uh, just for the opponent, which is really useful as well. Um, and then we've got Stoke the Flames. Four damage to any target. Can Convoke, so you don't have to pay four to do it. So it's really good as a finisher. If your opponent only has four hit points left, maybe you can't attack with things. Maybe you can't attack with some of your um, creatures on the ground, but you can attack with a Phoenix Chick, and you can Stoke the Flames to finish them off. Uh, doing four damage to the face is pretty uh, pretty effective in the late game. And then for the mana for um, for the red deck, we've only got 21 lands in this version, which I think is pretty much on target of what I'd expect. It doesn't include the rare land from uh, Kamigawa. You can include it. I would normally include one of them at the very least, just because it can make two more 1-1 one -one threats with haste, which works well with mechanized warfare and Phoenix Chick, because you can then bring them back from the graveyard easier. So it can work really well with those. Also, it can you can use it to stoke the flames as well. So it can become kind of two mana for stoke the flames. So there's no reason not to include it if you have it. If you don't want to craft it, then you know you can make do without it. It's fine. So for the rares and mythics in this deck, you don't need mechanized warfare, but it's rare. Squee you kind of is pretty good in there and is rare, and Felden is a rare as well. Everything else here is a common or uncommon. So the red deck, the reason why it's probably one of the most popular decks is because it is so cheap to cast. You don't, you could do this without Scree. You could do it without Mechanized Warfare. Oh yeah, and Bloodthirsty Adversaries are Mythic. You could do it without that. You can if you, um, if you don't have the wild cards or you don't want to spend them. So it can be a really, really cheap deck to cast. It's really fast. And if the opponent needs to take four turns to set up their moves, You'll probably kill them before they get a chance to do it. Uh, if you don't win by turn four or five with this deck, you've probably lost. That's generally how it goes with uh, red decks. So there we go. That's number one in our top 10 meta decks. So let me know what you think in the comments below from the top 10. Which of these 10 do you like to use? Have you crafted any of them? Do you Have you got to Mythic with any of them? Let me know in the comments below what you think. And don't forget, you can like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any future videos. And thanks for watching this one to the end. I will see you in the next one.